Isaiah 55 and then Hebrews chapter 4. Isaiah 55 verse 6. It is Old Testament doctrine. Uh, it's an Old Testament idea. But uh, there are some um, practical things or spiritual things we can pull out of it. And then Hebrews 4 verse 12. Uh, let's pray first. Lord, I do ask you to help us to understand your words. I do ask you to help us to understand the uh, intentions of the age that we're in. And as uh, parents and grandparents, help us to uh, do what we can to guard our children from the intentions of this world. Help us to uh, be faithful to thee. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, Isaiah 55, verse 6. It says, Seek ye the Lord. While he may be found, call ye upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts. And let him return unto the Lord and he will have mercy upon him and to our God for he will abundantly pardon. Okay, that's Old Testament method. Okay, but then he says this, for my thoughts, okay, God, for my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, saith the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. For as the rain cometh down, and the snow from heaven, and returneth not thither, but watereth the earth, and maketh it to bring forth and bud, that it may give seed to the sower and bread to the eater. So shall my word be that goeth forth out of my mouth, it shall not return unto me void, But it shall accomplish that which I please, and it shall prosper in the thing whereunto I sent it. Okay, so the word of God is mentioned there, and it's like water and things like that. But it goes forth, and it's going to accomplish exactly as God chooses, what pleases him. Now, that is a double-edged sword, if you go to Hebrews chapter 4. Okay, and often we think, we tend to think from our perspective that if we give forth the word of God, it's not going to return void. And and we tend to think, okay, then that means it's going to have a good result. That's not necessarily true. Okay, God's two-edged sword is sent out there for two reasons. One is to save and one is to destroy. Okay, and God is not only a God who is willing to pardon, but he is a God who's willing to judge. So the, the Bible itself is going out and it's going to accomplish what pleases the Lord. Hebrews 4, verse 12. Okay, the word, for the word of the Lord is quick. Now, unfortunately, we go back to our English class and we diagram this sentence. Okay, the word, the word itself, word is the subject of the sentence. Of God, prepositional phrase, is verb quick. Okay, quick in the Bible, you define the Bible terms by the Bible itself. Quick is to be made alive. So it's alive, quick and dead. Quick and dead, it says in the Bible, quick and dead, opposite dead life. So the word of God is quick. And powerful, the word of God is powerful. The word of God is sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow, and is, is, what is? Subject, word, is. A discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. That's why people don't read the Bible. Because as they read it, it reads them. This book reads into the mind and heart of the person reading it. And what they get out of the Bible is determined by their intents. Are they trying to uh, prove, they're trying to see if God is as smart as they are? He agrees with them? Okay, then God will let them think that. That's why these people often run to the Bible to try to prove what they say. But you'll see that they'll add a word, subtract a word, change a word, pull it out of the context, and they're not being honest. So the word itself, the book that I'm reading, discerns my thoughts and intents of my heart. Okay, neither is there any creature that is not manifest in his sight, but all things are naked and open unto the eyes of him with whom we have to do. 
Okay, so this is the God of the Bible. Okay, the unique traits of the Lord Jesus Christ compared to the usual traits of everybody else reveals that Jesus Christ is the one that has authority and he's the one that has the power. Now, Isaiah said that his thoughts are higher than our thoughts or superior to our thoughts, higher as the heavens is to the earth. And so what we're doing when you read a Bible is you're coming across the thoughts of God about certain issues. And you and I are to ask God, why do you have these thoughts? How can I get my thoughts like your thoughts? And when your thoughts start to comply with his, then you begin to understand okay, now I see why you said what you said. There's reasons behind those things. It's our position in life in order to seek after God, to read the Bible and discover, okay, now I understand, oh, I know why you created the devil. I know why you did that. I know why you did certain things. I can see the wisdom behind it. You had a purpose for everything. And you begin to discover the wisdom behind what God thinks about things, just because it's recorded in a Bible doesn't mean God approves of it. He records men's behavior, good and bad, showing you and I the results of it, and then he'll throw in his ideas behind it, why he does certain things. So that's his thoughts. Now, Paul in Hebrews revealed that this book right here, and the God who wrote or created this book, is the one who knows our inner workings. He knows our thoughts. If you would look at Romans 1.19. The designer and creator knows the inner workings of his creation. Okay, several years ago I took a two-day class to learn how to build a log house. Okay, when I was getting ready to take this class, I thought, two days? You're going to show us how to do this? Right. Well, they did it. So it was a two-day class, and then uh, I took it a second time, and uh, they kind of laughed because I took it a second time, but, uh, and then I started doing some of the things I learned in class. Now, they didn't suggest to drop the trees and do it all yourself. I did. I dropped the trees, peeled the bark, brought, or brought the trees, logs to my house, to the property, peeled the bark by hand, Put that uh, garage up first, the house second, and then the cabin first. Now, I could tell you everything about that structure. Why? I designed it. I built it. Now, everything we see around us, God is the designer. He designed it. He created it. Now, he did things a lot faster than I did. Okay, and so he knows our intricate details of what we're thinking. Romans chapter 1, verse 19, if I'm talking to an evolutionist or an atheist, uh, and I'm not going to try to, quote, prove to them my beliefs, I'm going to ask them this question, what evidence do you rely upon? I'm an atheist. What evidence do you rely upon? I rely upon evidence. What evidence do you rely upon? I had a, a witch years ago ask me why I believed what I believe. I said, because of scientific empirical proof. He said, I've never heard that before. Why? Romans 1.19. It says this, because that which may be known of God is manifest in them, for God hath showed it unto them, for the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made. Even his eternal power and God has so that they are without excuse. And so how do you know about God? Well, God created an animal, multiple animals, but one such animal, big animal, moose, can run through the woods in pitch blackness and not run into a tree. That tells us that the creator can see through darkness just like he can see through light. Because that's what the creator did. That creator has the sense of smell like any dog and better. That creator not only sees colors, but hears colors. Because there's a vibration that comes off of colors. Boy, when we get to heaven, you're going to see some amazing things. You're not only going to see the color, you're going to hear the vibration of the color. 
This is what people, international corporations, understand about diet and food. They know certain colors emit an energy to get you to eat their Big Mac, even though they know it's not good for your health. It's the colors. Watch the colors. Study things, and you'll see that. Now, the world knows these things. Why? To make a buck off people or to decrease world population, depending on what their intent is. And we know what their intent is because they tell you. Now, in Romans 1.20, it says Godhead. That's found three times in the Bible. That's the Bible word for people often say Trinity. Trinity is not a bad word. The Bible word is Godhead. So, in the beginning, God created Adam and Eve, and then they had a son. Three separate beings, one family, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Ghost. You know about God by studying his creation. The creation is not God. God is the creator. We worship the creator, not the creation. So this is how we know about him. So this tells us that this God who created everything going on and then sustained it through the birth process knows our inner workings. Buddha doesn't know that. Confucius don't know that. Allah doesn't know that. In Genesis chapter 6, verse 5, the God of the Bible knows the very thoughts that man thinks. God saw that the wickedness was man and great in the earth, and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. He knew the thoughts. Now, David told his son Solomon prior to death, he was giving Solomon some advice of to, uh, with the closing years of his life in First Chronicles 28, he said, And thou, Solomon, my son, know thou the God of thy father. Serve him with a perfect heart and with a willing mind. For the Lord searcheth all hearts and understandeth all the imaginations of the thoughts. Now that portion about God Almighty Jesus Christ did not set that portion aside when he was on earth. He read people's minds as a man, as a prophet. Now, in the Old Testament, on occasion, God would tell a prophet what a person actually was thinking. But not all the time. Jesus Christ knew exactly what these people were thinking when he's talking to them. And there were times that he revealed that. If you would look in Luke chapter 5. This is the God of the Bible. This is what sets Jesus Christ apart, totally different than anybody else who's ever walked this earth. Luke chapter 5, verse 22. It says, but when Jesus perceived their thoughts, he answering said unto them, what, re what reason ye in your hearts? He read their mind. Now, this is something different about Jesus Christ and the devil. The devil cannot read your mind. I don't care who it is, the rank Satanists, they can run some things through their mind, like one ex-Satanist that I know of that uh, was considering some things about somebody's got more power than I do, and eventually this person came to Jesus Christ and got saved. Now, she was a bride of Satan, actually had a wedding ceremony, married Satan. Okay, but in her mind... She reconsidered some things. Now, the devil couldn't read her mind. Now, the devil can give us thoughts, but he can't read our mind. God not only can give us thoughts, God can read the mind of what we're doing with the thought. That's different about him. Luke chapter 6, verse 8, about the Lord Jesus Christ. He knew their thoughts and said to the man which had the withered hand. Now, in this case... There's a man that's going to be healed on the Sabbath day, and he knew all the guys around there didn't like the idea, and so he knew the thoughts, and then he started to stink because of it. He created an issue right on the spot, and he pointed out their hypocrisy. He used that issue to point out their hypocrisy, and that's one of the two reasons why God's word is made manifest. One is to reveal the sincerity of a heart of an individual. And the other reason is to reveal the hypocrisy. And that's why they killed him. That's what the word of God will do. And if you do one of those two, it splits it. And God is reading their hearts. Luke chapter 11, verse 17. Same man, the son of man, the Lord Jesus Christ. Luke 11, verse 17. 
He said this, and he, but he, knowing their thoughts, said unto them. He's telling them what they're thinking. And then Luke chapter uh, 24, this is with his disciples. Okay, his disciples, after, before he died on the cross, he told them, I'm going to be killed such and such place. This is going to do the job. Uh, he said, I'm going to raise from the dead three days later. Peter disagreed and argued with him about it. And then three days later, he shows up. First thing he says, peace be unto you. They're scared to death. In Luke 24, verse 37, they were terrified and affrighted. And supposing they'd seen a spirit. But he said, unto, and he said unto them, why are you troubled? Why do thoughts arise in your heart? He read their mind. We're an open book to God. An open book. Now, a lot of times, you know, as parents, we don't know that our children's hearts, you know, we do the best we can and pray. But their heart is made manifest when they get out from the authority. You know what they've been thinking. Okay, now what does God know about their thoughts? In Daniel chapter 2, there was a king. He had a dream. He forgot the dream. He wanted his political advisors to interpret the dream. He went to his political advisors. He said, I, want, I need your interpretation of my dream. And they said, good, tell us a dream. And he said, I forgot it. They said, well, we can't answer that. He said, well, since you can't, we're going to cut your head off. And so then he sent out Melzar to execute the judgment. And Daniel and Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, those four guys, was going to get their head cut off. And Daniel said, what's the hurry? He said, well, the king had a dream, forgot the dream, and these guys can't interpret it. He said, well, give me a night, and we'll see about it. Melzar, okay, you get one night. He said, and after the night, God gave him the answer. And then he went to Nebuchadnezzar, and he says, uh, Neb, here's, here's what you dreamed. And Nebuchadnezzar... You're right. Oh, man, now I remember. How'd you get it? My God knows your thoughts. He said, since you know, tell me the interpretation. He gave him the interpretation. God knows our thoughts. He knows our intentions. It's like a little boy. His mom was trying to get his little boy to do something. He said, I want you to stand up. And he said, no. He said, stand up. Finally, the kid stood up. And she said, finally, you obeyed. He said, but I'm in my heart still sitting down. That's his intentions, <clears throat> you see? And God's looking at the intentions. And our intentions <clears throat> can override the action. And God's looking at the intentions. He's reading the heart. God says, you know what men think about? They think about themselves. <clears throat> That's what they think about. If you would, look in 1 Corinthians chapter 3. <clears throat> Now, sometimes you get around some of these really highly educated folk and you get start pointing out some flaws in their beliefs and they really get upset. Why do they get upset? Why? Because they're smart. They got the diploma to prove it. It's right there on the wall. And they've got a, you know, $100,000 debt. They got to pay it off. <clears throat> That's not real smart to me. I mean, going through four years of higher learning, I think they're higher because they're smoking something. And they get done, they say, we have learned that you can't know anything for certain. I could have told you that from the start, pal. I would have done it for half the money. And they think they're smart. The Bible's reading their heart. 1 Corinthians 3, verse 18, it says, Let no man deceive himself. If any man among you seemeth to be wise in this world, let him become a fool that he may be wise. <clears throat> For the wisdom of this world is foolishness with God, for it is written, He taketh the wise in their own craftiness. And again, the Lord knoweth the thoughts of the wise, that they are vain. You know why peer pressure is so powerful, especially amongst teenagers? <clears throat> you know, a teenager walks in a room and he's got a lighthouse. Now, what's a lighthouse? When I was in high school, when a guy got a whopper zit right here, we called that a lighthouse. I mean, it was bright. And one of my friends always got that zit right there. And it was a whopper. And we'd always razz him when he got that whopper. That's probably because he's not drinking enough water if you read the bulletin. Okay, and so all that stuff. Okay, but, uh, you know, a kid gets a, maybe a zit in, a, in another location. He comes in the classroom, he says, everybody's looking at a zit. 
No, they're not. They're worried about their own zits. They're all thinking about themselves. It's all about me. That's this generation. That's why if you don't agree with their opinion, you have offended me. Why? They're all about themselves. The Bible tells you what they're thinking about. They're thinking about themselves. If you want to enjoy life, realize that your opinion don't mean anything. You know, I'll put a one-inch square and you can write everything you know in that. I'll give it to somebody who cares. I mean, of this planet right now, 99.9% of these people don't even know I exist. I'm fine with that. There's a God in heaven that knows I exist. Thank God for that. But that's what God knows. He knows our inner thoughts. Then our thoughts are vain. This is why people are so easily offended in this age. It is a sign of the second coming of Jesus Christ. How dare you say that? Well, here's how I said it. The thought came to my mind. My mind said to my mouth, speak the words. That's how it came out. Nothing difficult about that. You know, and so Americans are so in love with themselves. How dare you say something like that? Very easily. No problem. You say, well, then I could say it about you. I said, I don't care. It doesn't matter. Why? Because we ought to be interested in what God thinks about us, not what other people think. God knows the inner thoughts of man. The second thing, if you would look in 2 Corinthians, in the New Testament, God raised the obligations of us higher than the Old Testament. Generally speaking, in the Old Testament, God basically judged actions. Thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not commit adultery, things like that. Now, of the Ten Commandments, one of them dealt with the intents of the heart, and thou shalt not covet. Now, covet is manifesting itself in other ways, but that's an intent of the heart, coveting, lusting after something. In the New Testament, God raised it where he's looking at the spirit behind things rather than the action. You'll see this in 2 Corinthians 3, verse 6 who hath made us able ministers of the New Testament, not of the letter, but of the Spirit. For the letter killeth, but the Spirit giveth life. That deals with our attitudes. God looks upon the heart. Man looks on the outward appearance. And the reason why God has done this in the New Testament is because he's given us more light about himself. And to whom much is given, much is required. So in the Old Testament, they didn't have the permanent indwelling of the Spirit of God for the righteous. They didn't have a lot of benefits that New Testament believers have. Hence, we should be living holier than those in the Old Testament, but with a mindset that is but by the grace of God. Because God's reading the heart. So God has revealed in the New Testament the power of the inner spirit of man. There's a power there. Okay, the third idea, real quick, the second was a quickie, but the third idea is God deals with man according to his intentions. He deals with us according to our hearts. This is why sincerity, honesty, uh, meekness, and humility are attitudes that God is looking at. Those attitudes, when they're within the heart of an individual or the mindset of an individual, God is generally patient with that individual. But he resisteth the proud. Why? Because the only way God can deal with a proud man is to give him a knuckle sandwich. Knock him down. Get his attention. That's the only way he can get his attention. He's got to knock him down. And a boy, America is a pride society. So God's dealing with the intents of the heart. That's what he's looking at. Now, if a person starts reading the Bible to try to justify themselves, because their spirit is wanting to justify themselves, oh, God loves me, like, I'm special. He will let them find the passages, make a little shift on it, and this person will run off and say, God loves me, I'm okay. I feel like a boy today. I feel like a girl. 
And they'll find passage in the Bible to help verify why they're deceiving themselves. Self-deception is a worse form. But when God gets involved, that's a step up. And this is why these people get so emotional, so angry, and then if you start asking why you're so mad, they can't give you a reason. They have no basis for it. Why? It's all about them. It's all about that individual. This is what Hollywood is cramming down the throats of people. Well, shall I say cramming that down or people foolishly turning on the telly and watching it? I mean, several years ago, uh, when my wife and I got married, we decided not to have a television. Oh, man. And it's fun going through Sam's Club when the guy tries to tell you, you know, it's cable. I don't got TV. <laughs> what am you? <laughs> I'm Amish. You know, we decided not to have one. And so about maybe six, seven years in, into it, we said, oh, let's get us a five-inch one. So we got a five-inch one, you know. And there were some things in there. After a while, I said, that's garbage. That's trash. Brent was about seven years old. I gave him a screwdriver. I said, take it apart. And you know what? He couldn't get it back together. He ruined it. And so forget that. Why? I know the intents of Hollywood. Okay, do I have a parent in this room that would take your five-year-old and your six-year-old to a gay parade? I don't think so. The news media won't even show you what takes place at a gay parade on purpose. I have, a, I have guys that I know that go street preaching there, not me. Now, I'm going to go street preaching down in Memphis at the 1st of May, and I'm not certain about it because I know what's going to be happening. But they don't broadcast that in public because it's bad. If they would broadcast that on television, unhindered, uncensored, 90% of Americans would say, that should be thrown out. The country folks and everything. I would say, even at, that, even at this perverted age of America, I would think a vast majority would say, That's, that is not wholesome. Okay, now, if as a parent, you would not be dumb enough... Or at least you would love your child enough not to take them to a gay parade. Right? Why? Because what's their intentions? They don't hide it. They do not hide their intentions. What they want to do with little boys and girls. Okay? The music industry. When you put music behind pictures, you are taking a powerful event. Music behind pictures. And if you study the music industry, not the music itself, but study the intentions. When somebody gets high up in the music industry, they have been so corrupted and perverted. Like Justin Bieber, that little sissy twerp, that thing was probably born a girl. If I had a guess, it was probably born a girl and switched. Yesterday was talking to Josh, my nephew. They, he grew up in China. Thailand is the sex place where you change. Thailand. He said some of the most beautiful women in Thailand were born boys. It's amazing what they do in Thailand. And so in American culture, that's what's happening. They switch them. This is why a lot of these music industry people will break down and they'll go bizarre because they have been programmed. Okay, now, if as a parent, you would not take your child to a gay parade, you would not take your child to the inner workings of the MTV, the music industry, but you'll gladly turn it on and watch their intentions and allow your children to watch that rot. I mean, you're, you might as well just take them. You're promoting the industry. What is the intent of Hollywood? Is the intent of the Hollywood the Bible? No. Study, you know, years ago, years ago, before I understood this stuff about the Disney company, 
my sister and brother-in-law, they, would, they went down there, I mean, every Christmas, like five, six years in a row. And I, I'm thinking, what's so good about it? Well, I win, and it is fun. But then I learned the behind-the-scenes things. My brother-in-law was at one of those things, and one of the workers said, did you know there's a city below this whole place? He said, yeah, I heard that. Did you know there's places where straight people can't go? Huh? Yeah. Do you know that the Disney company boasts of 40% of their employees to be sodomites? They don't use sodomites. They use LGBT, ABC, XYZ. They boast of that, 40%. That's not the ones that they, that's the ones they know of. So you can safely say 50% of the intentions of Hollywood is what to your children. That's what they're doing. If you doubt it, get on YouTube and look up the subliminal messages of Disney Company. Walt Disney was a 33rd degree Mason. I don't think he had good intentions for people to go there. You say it's for entertainment. Children don't understand that. Children don't discern that. I think television should be like a car where kids shouldn't shouldn't be able to look at some of this stuff until like 20 or so. And then with blinders. (laughs) Why? Because they are pumping it right into our homes. And this is why country folk used to be different than city folk. They're not now. Why the city has come through Hollywood. That's their intentions. They don't hide their intentions. And we as Christians need to recognize that we have an enemy. And that enemy is after our kids. I'm not saying that if you shelter from them that you are 100% guaranteed. I'm not saying that. But you sure do increase the odds. I mean, I played basketball at a college. We went, we went down to uh, Indiana State Penitentiary, had a couple games at Indiana State Penn at Pendleton. It's a f- weird feeling to be whistled at by guys. I mean, I was baby face, blonde hair, 19 years old, and a short guy walking by. He, he, Fine, fine, fine. Look at that behind. Ooh, oh, that's a bad feeling. Bad feeling. I did not get good vibes from that. Okay, that's Hollywood. That's Hollywood. Okay, I'm not saying that if you have intentions to go to Disney, you know, down to Disneyland, whatever it's called, Disney World, I don't know what it's called. Okay, I'm not saying you're wicked for doing that, but I'm saying... That if you have a child go up to that character, you ought to stand behind that character with sunglasses and say, don't you rape my kid. Pedophile, are you pedophile? You pedophile? You pedophile? Because almost all of those characters are. We have a girl down at the Rensselaer that used to come to church, said that she got molested right on Disney, right when she was on the lap of that being. I'm telling you the intentions. And as parents, we got to guard our kids from these things. They do not discern the differences. They don't discern that. It's getting in their spirit. Everything in Hollywood is scripted. Okay, you're watching a detective show. Okay, wholesome detective show. So a guy's in the police station, and all of a sudden, in the background, you see a prostitute walking in scantily clad clothes, lack of clothes. Why did, they, why did that happen? That was not happenstance. That is intended to get into the mind and eyes of your boys. That's on purpose. Everything Hollywood does is intended and on purpose and is intended to ruin our kids. It's intended to destroy the... That's why the family's in a mess. It's because they're sitting in front of the boob tube watching this stuff. Now, as an adult, you and I can sit there and, and a lot of times, you know, yell at the TV. Yell at it. Throw something at it. I knew a kid up in Chicago, he took a shotgun and shot it and left it in the living room just for a conversation piece. 
Okay, we can discern the intent of the media, right? We can discern that, right? We can discern the intents of what they're trying to get across to us. But young kids don't see that. They don't understand that. They see there sitting beside mom and mom says, oh, that's so cute. <laughs> yeah, that was a fag that just tried to tell you something. That's what that was. That actor or actress behind the scenes, like Rock Hudson, you know, all that crowd, that, I'm going back days. They had kids on set on reason. Almost every child actor, if they're honest, they will tell you they've been molested. Some of them tell you. But boy, do they quiet that. There's a person that just developed a documentary about Hollywood and the pedophilia and how rampant pedophilia is in Hollywood, and they wanted to put it on TV as a documentary. Almost had it on. Almost. Why? They're ratting them all out. And that's their intentions. God wants us to know that God is looking at the intents of our heart and we need to have some discretion to recognize the intentions of this world is not for our benefit. And we need to stand up to the enemy. And we need to guard. Hey, I mean, if you're going to feed that stuff to your kids, don't complain when they act it out. I mean, some of these kids sit there and watch it on TV. They watch a cartoon, F this, F that, F this, F that. And then they go to school and they say to the teacher, you effing teacher. And they get in trouble. Why do they get in trouble? They don't discern the differences. I mean, we, we talk to these little bus kids, five, six, seven years old. You should hear some of the things they say. I didn't know some of that stuff when I was 20. I had not a clue about this stuff. And they're telling you in, they could tell in detail stuff that they shouldn't know until they're married. It's a, our culture is falling apart. You know one of the big things, why I think the whole media is against the Russian thing? Russia's come full circle and they've got Christianity in Russia. It's allowed on the streets in Russia. They have laws against homosexuality in Russia. Might have to pick up and move. I would have never thought I'd ever say that. But things have come full circle. It's amazing where America, and some people that come to this country from the communist culture that grew up in a communist culture, they'll say America is just like it was when they fell. And nobody's paying attention to them. Not a thing. God is looking at the intents of our heart. Why should we do what we do? If you would, look at 1 Corinthians chapter 13. Why should we do what we do? It's because of your love for Jesus Christ. Can you honestly tell me that you're sitting down and watching these things for these kids and you're telling me that if Jesus sat right beside me, he would approve of it? Go kid somebody else. Your Hollywood is, you got a Hollywood Jesus. Not the Jesus of the Bible. 2 Corinthians chapter 13. Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels and have not charity, I am become a sounding brass or tinkling cymbal. And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith so I can remove mountains and have not charity, I am nothing. Why? God's looking at the intents of our heart. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned and have not charity, it profiteth me nothing. What should be the intents of our heart of anything we do? Because of my love for Jesus Christ. I mean, why do we do such and such? Well, I love Jesus Christ. And I have an underlying reason why. You know, uh, why do I like play basketball? Well, I hate jogging. My way of staying in shape. If I don't, I get old, fat, and die. Plus, I get to witness. When these guys, I get to talk to them on the side, tell them about the Lord, or verify their salvation. You see, that's a, it's a, it's a, there's an intent behind those things. Okay? And the Lord wants us to do what we do because we love Jesus Christ. Why should we guard our children? Because we love them. 
because we love Jesus Christ and we want to prevent them, prevent some harm that's intended for them. Hollywood has no good, zero good intentions. Look what Hollywood does when an actor happens to come out for Jesus Christ. Look at their response. I mean, they are vicious towards anybody that happens. And, and they're usually the ones that come out for Jesus is really contemporary-minded, like Kurt Cameron. Eh, contemporary, not real Bible believers. But at least they did mention Jesus Christ. At least they came out for him. Praise the Lord. But boy, Hollywood sure does hate them. They loved them when they was in their room. They sat, they thought within their box. Well, you think outside of their box, they don't like the idea. And that's, America's destroying itself from the inside. And where's the destruction? It's coming from Hollywood. It's coming from the media. Media, medium, medium. They're programming. Don't we get that? We don't get that. Amazing. God's looking at the thoughts and intents of our heart. And our, hopefully our desire is to love Jesus Christ. Okay, let's pray. Lord, I do pray you'd help us recognize that uh, <clears throat> we live, yeah, we got a free society. Yeah, we got a lot of benefits. Yeah, we got all that stuff, all these distractions. But Lord, I do ask and pray that you'd help us as parents and grandparents to guard our children. And... Uh, if something has been going on that shouldn't be, help us to have wisdom to replace it with something better. And Lord, I just pray that you'd help us to have charity toward thee, sincerely, honestly, humbly. And when we have an opportunity to speak forth your words, don't do it with a meek heart. Because deception is rampant in our culture. And our culture's got cancer. Cancer's eating away at this culture of our country. Lord, oh God, oh God, I just pray you'd help us to seek after thee and have charity towards thee. Well, heads bowed and eyes are closed. The piano will play. The altar's open. It ain't getting better. And it's going to be exponentially getting worse. But the glorious thing about God and the Bible, where sin abounds, grace doth much more abound. Lord, thank you for a blessed book you've given us. And Lord, uh, this society is just falling apart. It, start, it began under Christian principles. It began, but it's dying. It's dying. It's dying. And Lord, I just pray somehow you'd have mercy. We're not going to demand you to bless our country because we are not deserving. But I am asking that you would pardon and have mercy. That's what I'm asking for. Lord, I just pray you'd help us to be faithful to you because we love you.